presentation. You know, uh, John Steinbeck was known as a novelist, but he was also a war correspondent during World War II. And we're thrilled tonight to have our visiting scholar here at the National Steinbeck Center, Dr. David Warbrook, present John Steinbeck, the war correspondent. Thanks to all of the, the staff of the Steinbeck Center for inviting me out. And I'm uh, the visiting scholar at the Steinbeck Center for 2019. Okay, I'll be I'll be as loud as you need. Um, so uh, and to give a talk on Steinbeck as a war correspondent in the World War II section of the exhibit uh, is a real treat. Um, as I look around at some of the images, you know, I, I'm not from this part of, of California or, or any other part. I'm from England originally, and uh, that's a picture of Steinbeck and Max Wagner uh, during the, the, the bombing of London. Uh, so it's uh, wonderful to get to chat with you in this space. So um, you, you know the story about the Nobel Peace, uh, so the Nobel uh, Prize for Literature. And Steinbeck talked about what, what it was the writer was supposed to do. What was the ancient commission of the writer? He said that, you know, the writer has to expose our grievous faults and failures, has to dredge up to the light our dark and dangerous dreams to try and improve things. And the writer uh, has to declare and celebrate man's proven capacity for greatness of heart and spirit, the gallantry and defeat for courage, compassion, and love, uh, and the endless war against weakness and despair. These are the bright rally flags of hope an emulation. And those words written uh, a generation after World War II, uh, I think, uh, can help us think through uh, Steinbeck's balancing act during World War II. Start off by saying, I think Steinbeck was, uh, during World War II, a patriot, uh, very much so, uh, and also uh, had very strongly pacifist leanings. Uh, I don't think he was a uh, a full-blown pacifist by any means, but he certainly had pacifist uh, leanings, but uh, a deeply uh, patriotic uh, man, but also a man in a state of enormous turmoil. And you would think, why at the peak of uh, uh, his, his writing career? Why with all of the fame that accompanied the Grapes of Wrath, would, not, would Steinbeck not be writing uh, a wave, a, a sort of more joyful wave, but he wrote to his friend Elizabeth Otis in October uh, 1939. This is just, uh, Grapes of Wrath had come out in April. So we're just about six months later and he writes to Elizabeth Otis and says, the last year has been a nightmare, all in all. One nice thing to think of is the speed of obscurity. And he explained that in a few months, everybody would have stopped buying the Grapes of Wrath and everybody uh, would forget about the book, uh, and of course that, that didn't happen. Uh, in late January 1940, uh, the movie uh, version uh, was, uh, was released, and Steinbeck described it as a, a harsher thing than the book in the way in which it represented the struggles of uh, migrant families. So Steinbeck's fame at this point, of course the receipt of the Pulitzer Prize, uh, would come in 1940 as well. So, as the world enters World War II, Steinbeck is on a high on one level, but his personal life is falling apart, his marriage uh, to uh, Carol Steinbeck is falling apart, and I'll just periodically uh, put in these little chronological uh, sort of asides to give you a sense of what's going on in different periods. FDR meets with Steinbeck in May and September 1940, and Steinbeck is talking to him about the impact of German propaganda in Latin America and suggests to FDR that the U.S. set up a propaganda division in Latin America to counter German propaganda. So Steinbeck very much in the orbit uh, of the president. Spring 1941 separates from Carroll. He's been having an affair with Gwyn Conger. Uh, and he also starts writing radio speeches for the Foreign Information Service. And then, of course, the attack on Pearl Harbor, December the 7th, 1941. And on that same day, uh, he completes the second draft uh, of a novel. It's right uh, behind you. The moon is down. Uh, and uh, U.S. declares war on uh, Japan the next day, and then a few days later on Germany. And Steinbeck, at that point, 
uh, writes to William Donovan, coordinator of information, and he sends this memo on to FDR, and the memo is about this. Japanese internment hasn't occurred yet. Uh, the relocation and, and internment of 110,000 Japanese Americans has not yet taken place, but Steinbeck writes to the government and says, please don't think about implementing a policy such as internment. He describes the loyalty of the people of Japanese descent that he knows, and he says, if you were to administer a loyalty oath, the deep honesty of the Japanese would necessitate that they would either declare their loyalty to the U.S. or be honest in not declaring it, declaring their adherence to the Japanese emperor, and you could simply deport those who took the, the loyalty oath and did not declare their loyalty to the country. Steinbeck felt it would be a very small number, certainly wouldn't have left the stain on the country that uh, internment has, and of course, uh, reparations paid in the wake of uh, internment several generations later. So, Steinbeck was actually the first American writer of note to step forward against uh, the internment policy. And he actually offered uh, an alternative that, you know, while loyalty tests are not a terribly democratic thing, uh, either uh, would have been considerably more humane than what played out. Early 1942, Steinbeck is working, uh, unpaid, for the Office of War Information, also for the Writers War Board, the Air Force, and for the COI, the Coordinator of Information, which later becomes the OSS, Office of Strategic Services, which eventually will develop into the CIA. In March 1942, uh, Moon is Down is published, and then November of that year, uh, a book called Bombs Away. So the Moon is Down, what, what can we say about uh, this work? Well, the uh, first draft of the novel was rejected uh, by the government uh, because it was actually set in an American town, and there was real concern that this work would create fear uh, in the American public. Uh, so in the subsequent version, the work is set in an unnamed Scandinavian country, yet everybody knows it's Norway. <laughs> and the, the Moon is Down has a sort of unusual uh, genesis as a work. You know, Steinbeck had normally written all of his works. You've seen Steinbeck's handwriting uh, in the journals, right? He, he wrote in this very neat script, and then um, certainly with Carol, uh, his wife Carol would type those works, and then in the later phase of his life, Elaine would type, and uh, Gwyn, we were chatting earlier, Gwyn, uh, less, less uh, of the <laughs> typing uh, there, but th this is not really uh, about that so much as Steinbeck felt that there might be another way to do this sort of work. So he decided to dictate The Moon is Down, and to have a stenographer, and he hired a, a woman, and he started reading the uh, text that she was putting in front of him and realized that she was actually taking out the pieces of the text that were most critical of the Germans. And then he learned that she was attending uh, German-American Bund uh, meetings. So Steinbeck would fire this uh, stenographer and <laughs> move, move forward with a less pro-German uh, person. So the moon is down. Uh, it's been criticized quite heavily. Uh, by the critics. Uh, at the time, there was this uh, sort of sense that Steinbeck was showing or depicting too much humanity uh, among uh, the Nazi invaders, uh, showing them as actual uh, human beings rather than just you know, soulless, uh, uh, humanityless tyrants. And I think that was part of Steinbeck's nature to try and understand people and to move beyond you know, caricatured representations of people. So I think there's some truth in that, but there was a larger message to the novel. And Steinbeck talked about how there were uh, herd men, herd men, men who were part of a herd, and they could win battles, but he said it was free men who would win the war. And The Moon is Down was a novel about how a free people, a free society would eventually prevail over uh, the invaders, over their oppressors. Uh, it's a fascinating 
poster from the, the, the movie, it was apparently was written with fury uh, and <laughs> produced, produced with greatness. So, uh, do we, I don't think we have that one uh, up in the exhibit, but if you can find that, written with fury, produced with greatness, it does have Doris Bowden, Rose of Sharon from uh, The Grapes of Wrath, and she's quite brilliant uh, in, in the movie uh, adaptation. The movie comes out in March 1943, and just a quick aside that I'll come back to, the movie rights were sold for a reported $300,000, which was the most that had ever been paid for the movie rights to a novel at that point. But I'll return to that. Uh, November 1942, Bombs Away is published, and it was described, uh, it's been described by one Steinbeck scholar as uh, as close a parallel uh, as we have to an advertisement pr uh, poster uh, for the Air Force. Uh, but it was a real struggle for Steinbeck because while he was promoting uh, the Air Force and trying to generate I an interest in that uh, branch uh, among young men, he was also doing so with great trepidation because, he, the, because of his pacifist leanings. He was very concerned that this book might encourage people to sign up and, and uh, lose their lives as a result of uh, his, his writings. Bombs Away, I think, uh, was the basis for a movie that I don't think has ever acknowledged it, a movie called Memphis Bell uh, that was uh, released in 1990 about a World War II bomber crew. Uh, but it's a book that I think in some ways reminds us of The Grapes of Wrath because it's very much about, if you remember in The Grapes of Wrath, the Jodes and the idea of the family unit, the phalanx. Uh, with the bomber crew, you get this sense of the individual uh, being uh, subverted within the, the larger group uh, for the purposes of achieving uh, a goal. But Bombs Away, a book designed to uh, promote the unity of uh, uh, these bomber crews. Jump back to our chronology for a moment. Early 1943, U.S. forces are, are winning uh, in the Pacific. Uh, those battles of Midway and Carl Sea have long since passed. The tide has turned. Uh, Steinbeck writes a novella, Lifeboat, unpublished, we'll come back to that. Uh, early 1943, uh, February, uh, Stalingrad, uh, a part of the war that we should always remember, two million casualties, dead and wounded at the Battle of Stalingrad, far and away the largest, uh, costliest battle uh, of World War II. Uh, spring 1943, the Allies are succeeding in North Africa, uh, and Right as these events are going on, the U.S. Army and Navy are investigating Steinbeck, particular emphasis on his novels from the 1930s, and also his connections. Uh, who was showing up at his house? What sort of mail was arriving at the door? Uh, and there were some uh, neighbors uh, from his time in Monterey, Pacific Grove, who reported that all kinds of dodgy literature was showing up at uh, Steinbeck's residence. So. Investigating Steinbeck while he is actually working uh, on a largely unpaid basis for the country, for the government. So bombs away, uh, he decided to uh, donate all of the uh, royalty revenue from bombs away to uh, the uh, it's the Air Force Widows Fund, right? And um, it turns out that the government will only let him do that after he's paid taxes uh, on the royalty. So, uh, you know, he's, he's paying the government for the opportunity to, to work for them. Uh, he requests uh, officer rank in Army Air Force Intelligence, but that request is denied. And then in Mar March 1943, divorce from Carol is finalized. Marries Gwyn uh, 11 days later, not uncommon, right? That, uh, you know, quite soon after a divorce being filed, a, a marriage of two people that intended to marry would, would take place soon after. Uh, what's unusual is that he's applied for a job as a war correspondent with the New York Herald Tribune, and in June, early June, he's on a ship to England. And uh, Gwyn, uh, not, not terribly uh, happy, that uh, just a couple of months into the, the marriage, uh, Steinbeck is on. So Steinbeck was quite close to uh, another of the great war correspondents of the era, Ernie Pyle, and there's this wonderful 
description that Steinbeck writes of Ernie Pyle. Uh, it says there's the war of the homesick, weary, funny, violent, common men who wash their socks in their helmets, complain about food, whistle at any girls, uh, lug themselves through as dirty a business as the world has ever seen and do it with humor and dignity and courage. And that's Ernie Pyle's war. I think that's a beautiful description of the very plain, straightforward writing uh, of Ernie Pyle about the ordinary experiences of, of ordinary lives and uh, providing real heroism to those lives. And uh, Pyle writes of Steinbeck, we have no other writer who's so likely to catch on paper the inner things that most people don't know about war. I think their styles are a little bit different. Uh, Ernie Pyle's a little bit more direct, Steinbeck maybe a little bit more uh, reflective, uh, but I think they both connected uh, with the public in a big way. Uh, they both seem to understand the lives of the people they were writing about and empathize and appreciate, uh, just as Steinbeck had done in his writings during the 1930s. Tragic, of course, that uh, Ernie Pyle would, uh, would die uh, after the war was technically over, right? Uh, um, shot by a Japanese sniper, and that Steinbeck had actually tried to discourage him from going on that final uh, reporting trip. So, the result of uh, Steinbeck's trip uh, over to uh, London, and then uh, from London uh, to North Africa, and to uh, Sicily and the Italian mainland, uh, is a series of dispatches that are later gathered uh, in 1958 in a book called Once There Was a War. Uh, the dispatches are published uh, everywhere in the country, with the exception of one state, uh, the state I live in, the state of Oklahoma, uh, <laughs> refused to, well, I don't know if it was that the state refused to allow any newspapers to, um, to, to publish those dispatches, or the newspapers were already mad uh, from the late 30s. But uh, once there was a war, Steinbeck is a war correspondent. That's the real uh, sort of focus of, of the talk. And I want to just share with you a few of the passages from once there was a war that for me, are uh, uh, some of the most moving and powerful ones. You know, I'm a little bit, uh, my, my, my Englishness is coming out a little bit. Uh, you know, I picked this one about the quality to the people of Dover. I don't know any more quality to the people of Dover than anywhere else in the south of England in general, but say maybe the people of London, more especially where I'm from. But uh, that may well be the key to the coming German disaster. They're incorrigibly, incorruptibly unimpressed. Jerry, uh, the Germans, is like the weather to him. He complains about it and then promptly goes about what he was doing. And there's a theme in Steinbeck's writing about war that the one thing people hate is to be ignored. Uh, we see that in The Moon is Down. Uh, the German invaders just hate the fact that this local population just walks through the streets and doesn't look at them. Uh, and we'll see it uh, a little bit later in Russia as well. And here are some images. Uh, number of you are familiar with this fella uh, here and here, uh, Bob Hope. Uh, Bob Hope visiting uh, with uh, uh, soldiers who've been injured. And Steinbeck uh, wrote one of the columns uh, in Once There Was a War on Bob Hope. And he just really had a tremendous affinity uh, for Hope. And what he published in July 26, 1943, probably the finest review that Bob Hope ever received. Um, so talks about how hard uh, Bob Hope worked month after month to try and uh, help uh, American soldiers get over uh, you know, their, their sort of terrible situation, the pain they're experiencing. And this moment where he's writing about Bob Hope's work in hospitals, he talks about uh, how it hurts many of the men to laugh, and it hurts the knitting bones and strains at the, at the <coughs> sutured incisions, and yet the laughter is a great medicine. And in the last sentence of that dispatch, he writes, there's a man for you. There's really a man. And which got me thinking about what was so funny about Bob Hope. Were the jokes really uh, that funny? And, and it turns out, that I'm just, I'll let you read, but quite, I mean, maybe humor doesn't change much over the generations. But this one about the airman uh, making his first parachute drop. And... His first lieutenant tells him to pull the cord and tells him that when he hits the ground, there'll be a station wagon waiting 
to drive him back to the base. So the airman jumped out of the plane, pulled the cord, nothing happened, and he said, I bet the station wagon won't be there either. <laughs> <laughs> this, other, uh, this other joke, apparently Bob Hope delivered it after the, the ladies uh, in the hospital who uh, were singers, uh, after they uh, sang a beautiful rendition of uh, uh, As Time Goes By, uh, Steinbeck, uh, sorry, Bob Hope, uh, at the very end of this, with these soldiers with tears streaming down their faces, said, fellows, the folks at home are having a terrible time about eggs. They can't get any powdered eggs at all. They've got to use the old-fashioned eggs, the kind that you break open. <laughs> <laughs> but not always funny. So speaking about what war correspondents saw but didn't write about, you might have seen the splash of dirt and dust that's a shell burst and a small Italian girl in the street with her stomach blown out, and you might have seen an American soldier standing over a twitching body crying. Um, one of the most moving descriptions of the civilian uh, tragedy of war that soldiers witness uh, daily. And then this, one of my favorites of all the dispatches, uh, it said the Grapes of Wrath sort of looms as a, a shadow over uh, Steinbeck in World War II. Uh, the Italian people greet the American conquering American and British troops with different methods in different parts of the country, but with enthusiasm that amounts to violence. And one method of showing enthusiasm is to throw any fruit or vegetable that happens to be uh, in uh, season at the occupying troops as a, a way to say thank you. And Steinbeck describes how in Sicily the grapes were ripe, and many a soldier got a swipe across the face with a heavy bunch of grapes tossed with the best will in the world, and the juice ran down the inside of their shirts. And after a march of a few blocks, troops would be pretty well drenched in grape juice, which would draw flies. So, and then the description of veterans. Steinbeck himself uh, suffered from PTSD, uh, burst eardrums, partial amnesia, and he talked about why a lot of veterans didn't seem to remember and didn't want to talk about the war. He described uh, what happens to the human body during combat, um, describes the physical process, and how through that process, under extended bombardment or bombing, the ner nerve ends are literally beaten, the eardrums are tortured. Um, men are not normal men after these situations. And when afterwards they seem to be reticent, perhaps they don't remember <coughs> very well. Steinbeck here uh, is in a unit with Douglas Fairbanks Jr. And this was a PT boat that uh, would make forays up the uh, northern Italian coastline uh, to draw away defensive formations, uh, thinking that that's where an invasion would take place uh, rather than uh, to the south. And for uh, his service, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. received a silver star and he recommended Steinbeck for a Silver Star, but Steinbeck, of course, was not allowed to join uh, the military, so couldn't receive any military uh, offers. Uh, 1944, early 1944, Steinbeck saw Lifeboat, and he just, he hated it. I'll tell you why in a moment. And then Cannery Row, published in 1945. Uh, then New York Herald uh, Tribune in July 1945, sort of suggest to Steinbeck that maybe he should go and cover the Nuremberg war trials and Steinbeck says uh, no he's, he's not ready, he's, not, he's just not up to that. And then as the war comes to a close uh, he writes to Gwyn uh, about uh, the situation after the dropping of the atomic bombs. He says I, I don't feel like getting drunk at these things, I feel more tearful than anything else. The, the war I think ends in great sort of sadness for him, there's not a sense of euphoria when we look back on some of those uh, moments, you know, why is he so upset by lifeboat? Well, in no small part because uh, its director has taken what was a quite subtle portrayal of the only African American character uh, in the story, a very empathetic portrayal, uh, and he's created a stock uh, African American character portrayal, and Steinbeck was very upset about that. He was also upset because there's one sort of 
representative of working class, blue collar people, somebody who works with his hands, and that character is also uh, not treated terribly well uh, by Hitchcock. Uh, Steinbeck thought that Hitchcock was uh, a supercilious, um, say arse in the... Uh, <laughs> okay, so he, he, Steinbeck wasn't a, a fan of Hitchcock's at all and um, was really disappointed, tried to get his name taken off uh, the credits uh, but unsuccessfully. And it really is a wonderful film if you, if you haven't seen Lifeboat. Uh, and then uh, a less well-known movie uh, came out in 45, a medal for Benny. Uh, this has uh, got a poster over here for Medal for Benny, right behind you, so uh, Medal for Benny, a story about a, a character who goes off and becomes a war hero, though the town hadn't, much t hadn't had much time for him uh, prior to the war. This was a sort of ne'er-do-well in the town, but then uh, uh, the town embraced him, and it's sort of a comment on maybe the shallowness of that. Uh, also a pretty interesting uh, movie. And then Canary Row. So Steinbeck wrote that um, a couple of soldiers had said to him, to him uh, as he was uh, leaving um, you know, his, his time overseas, uh, said, could you write something for us, uh, something funny, something to help us stop thinking about the war. And he wrote Cannery Row, which there are funny moments, but that's not by any means uh, an uplifting uh, book. Uh, Malcolm Cowley, the critic, referred to it as a poison cream puff. Uh, <laughs> In some ways, I think Canary Row might be considered the first novel of the American counterculture. When you think about uh, Jack Kerouac and On the Road, and you think about Mac and the Boys, and uh, the actual language that uh, Steinbeck uses to describe Mac and the Boys, uh, maybe so. So, it's interesting that in the exhibit, you, you, you move through Steinbeck in World War II, and then you, you sort of the transition point here between Steinbeck and the world and Steinbeck and World War II and that's the trip to, to Russia uh, in 1947 uh, with uh, Robert, uh, Robert uh, Kapp, the photographer. And this is a fascinating trip. I think Steinbeck is, is highly underrated as a uh, travel writer, not just Travels with Charlie but a Russian journal. And something's going on here. I mentioned in The Grapes of Wrath, we've got that theme of uh, the phalanx, the Jode family becoming this, uh, this group, people's, uh, people maybe setting aside their individualism, focusing on the needs of the group. And in 1949, Steinbeck writes, I think I believe one thing powerfully, that the only creative thing that our species has is the individual lonely mind. Two people can create a child but I know of no other thing created by a group. The group ungoverned by individual thinking is a horrible, destructive principle. The great change in the last 2,000 years was the Christian idea that the individual soul was very precious. In The Grapes of Wrath, we talk about the movement from I to we, right? From the individual to the group, and Steinbeck here is talking about a movement from we to I, and I know of no other thing created by a group. Two people can create a child. Well, you know, two people actually created a Russian journal, right? It was Steinbeck and, uh, and uh, his photographer. Not his photographer, a pretty famous photographer. Uh, so, one of the images uh, is, uh, is called Wash Day in Stalingrad. And it's a sort of image of, of human hope, right? In the midst of the uh, carnage of Stalingrad, a battle where, where two million people died or were wounded. Uh, here's, here's a woman getting on with the business of, of life, hanging out, uh, hanging the washing out to dry. Uh, he has descriptions of people literally coming out of uh, holes, sort of, uh, you know, bunkers underneath these buildings and trying to get on with their lives. He also provided uh, a sort of comparative overview of the destruction of World War II that, um, oh, we saw what was the film, uh, it was, uh, um, Kennedy's and then Johnson's uh, uh, Secretary of State, uh, McNamara's, McNamara's um, what's the, the title of that? Uh, the Fog of, the 
fog of war. The fog of war, right? In, in, in the fog of war, there's a moment where uh, McNamara talks about uh, the, uh, the uh, bombing of uh, Japanese cities. And he draws this comparison. He says, what if that had been an American city? What American city is about the same size uh, as Tokyo? Uh, it goes through this long list of Japanese cities that were bombed. And, and Steinbeck in uh, a Russian journal published in 1948 writes, if the United States were completely destroyed from New York to Kansas, we'd have about the area of destruction that Ukraine has. If six million people were killed, not counting soldiers, 15% of the population, you'd have an idea of the casualties of the Ukraine. Counting soldiers, there'll be many more. But six million out of 45 million civilians have been killed. Try to help an American readership understand the scale of uh, human suffering in Russia and also understand that it's a country filled with humanity, just like any other country, despite its, its leadership. It's also uh, a passage in a Russian journal about ignoring uh, former, uh, sorry, for, uh, the former invaders. You've got these German troops who are uh, now tasked with cleaning up uh, the residue of their uh, destruction, uh, actually trying to clean up um, you know, uh, Soviet cities. Uh, and he describes how they raged through the country like frantic, uh, cruel children, and now they're marching through the streets in their German uniforms and the Ukrainian people don't look at them. They turn away when the columns march through the streets. They look through these prisoners and over them and do not see them. And perhaps this is the worst punishment that could possibly be inflicted on them. Mm. I'm not going to talk about Steinbeck in, uh, as a Vietnam War correspondent, but you, you know maybe at maybe uh, some point in the future, but uh, Steinbeck is a correspondent again for a few months in, in Vietnam uh, in late 66, early 67. Uh, and you can see uh, here, he unites again with Bob Hope, and you can see uh, here just how tired and worn down Steinbeck looks, that, uh, that to me is a pretty telling photograph, but it's not the one I want to end with. I'll end with this one here, which is this one here. Steinbeck with the actor, soldier, childhood friend, uh, Max Wagner. We have the, uh, uh, the tape, uh, the oral history with, uh, with Max Wagner. And they're there in London in 1943. And this one speaks to me particularly because my mother, uh, 82 now, was evacuated from London uh, shortly before this. A uh, whole generation of, uh, of London children were sent out to the countryside uh, for protection. And my uh, father-in-law, uh, Alfred, who is 92 now, um, had a bomb land in uh, the back garden of the row of houses and lived in one of these houses, and it didn't go off right away. Uh, there was a several minute delay uh, where uh, Alfred managed to uh, help evacuate uh, everybody in that row of homes on the street, and when the bomb went off, every single uh, home collapsed. And when I grew up in London, there were these we, we had one bookcase, and there were a number of Steinbeck books in that case. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't figure it out at the time. Why would there be books by this American author? Well, we had some, you know, we had some pretty good ones, right? Some Shakespeare and Dickens and, <laughs> uh, you know, some good British authors. Why was there so much John Steinbeck? And, and over the years, over the decades, I've seen members of my extended family reading Steinbeck books and it's a very sort of working class family and I think what it is is that they appreciated Steinbeck's portrayal of ordinary people and uh, growing up in that sort of culture of, uh, of hard work and uh, hope that uh, your hard work will be appreciated uh, and uh, certainly a very you know, rigid social class system. I think Steinbeck spoke to a lot of people in Britain for his efforts to connect with uh, with ordinary people. So, for me, that's the the sort of picture that says it all. Steinbeck standing uh, 
uh, in the, the ruins of bombed out uh, uh, London, and whether that's just a photo opportunity or, or an act of uh, defiance, that's the image that takes me back to the people of Dover uh, and their uh, ability to sort of uh, carry on in the face of uh, the, the German onslaught. So, what do we make of this period in Steinbeck's life? I think Steinbeck was struggling to maintain the ancient commission of the writer, uh, to be true to himself as a writer and not be a propagandist. I think he was trying hard to be a patriot uh, in the face of, uh, of a pacifistic uh, tendencies and a real uh, concern that um, it would be better to put an end to man's inhumanity to man as he had advised in, in dubious battle uh, than to have this kind of carnage happen again and again. Uh, but I think a lot of the themes that we focus on when we think about Steinbeck in the 1930s, writing about migrant workers and their families and helping show the human side uh, of their lives is reflected in his war reportage and much of his war writings. Uh, and that, I think, is why um, so many people from my background have, have uh, managed to connect with Stein, Steinbeck. And, you know, maybe why we should pay perhaps a little bit more attention to uh, the World War II years. I'll stop at that point. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to take a stab at wow. that. Oh, wait, Actually, so I, Steinbeck I, was I, being investigated. investigated by the Navy. Yeah. How did he keep from becoming demoralized by doing what he thought was acts of patriotism right. and being under suspicion? And was he investigated by the department? Uh, oh, was it was a up. <laughs> so Steinbeck is, is, is very much a part of uh, the McCarthy era in, you know, more in the sense of his standing up against uh, McCarthy uh, and his accusations. Um, here, um, during World War II, Steinbeck understands that he's being investigated because of the you know, presumed, supposed radicalism of his work in the late 30s. But he's desperate to try and help the country. And you look at these different agencies that he's actually working for, and the efforts he goes through. I think Steinbeck, when he's Steinbeck, I mean, his efforts to get to get passports and visas are slowed down at every turn. Mm -hmm. And he sort of keeps trying. And I think the war correspondent thing, why does a man, uh, what is it, two months into a marriage, uh, leave? Because he'd been trying to leave for years. I mean, he's been trying to actually serve his country for years. And finally, uh, he's able to go. He's got the clearance. And you know, that call to country, it was not something he had to do, and you know, it's, it's a poignant moment when he advises Ernie Pyle to not go on his last trip. You know, Steinbeck didn't have to go on his first trip, uh, but he chose to do so. I think he, he persevered. He'd been trying to get sort of government clearance, and when he finally got it, he decided to go. And, and he was deeply demoralized and frustrated <coughs> by the government's inability to uh, recognize and support the fact that he was trying to uh, yeah. serve the nation's interests. Even in Log from the Sea of Cortez, right? He's, uh, he's um, you know, recalling uh, some um, trips to the Japanese coastline and, and uh, information that generations of, of American biologists, of biologists from around the world, have gathered. So, We've got all this information, you know, that could be shared with the government. And it's always sort of surprise that the government doesn't embrace, um, you know, his, uh, his efforts. I think it was very frustrating for him. It's a, it's a, a difficult period. But I do think that he, he was determined, right? He, he was determined that he would uh, be of service to the country. He does actually try and, you know, join up the military service. Uh, he takes uh, and passes uh, uh, a physical. Uh, yeah. Did you 
mention that he suffered from PTSD? Yes, yes. Because that was some very vivid writing, detail yes. that he did describe yeah. that. Um, he, Steinbeck said that uh, he gave an actual number of American troops that he said were suffering from PTSD. Um, can, can you remember the figure? It's like more than 100,000. I think he may have said 150,000 American troops are suffering from PTSD. Um, and he described his own symptoms and clearly... As a what? war correspondent. Yes, yes. Because he was traveling with Douglas Fairbanks unit uh, on their, you know, as, as a part of their operations. Um, you know, he, he, he was in as much danger as lo of, of losing his life as anybody in that unit. And that's what Fairbanks uh, realized when he, when he recommended Steinbeck for the Silver Star. But, uh, you know, and the whole unit sort of recognized that he'd, so he really had embedded himself in that group. Yes. The moon is down. <coughs> Didn't they realize that it was sort of a bestseller in Nazi-occupied Europe, a capital crime to possess one? Yes, yes. So. Uh, it gets um, it gets translated uh, into the language of every occupied country, um, and uh, I, I forgot to come back to the uh, the story about the three hundred thousand um, uh, dollar payment. I'll, I'll come to that. so Steinbeck um, <coughs> describes uh, that the the boat he was on with Fairbanks Jr. Um, was sort of uh, it, it sort of accompanied a, a destroyer, and uh, Steinbeck at times would be sleeping on that ship. And there's a story of uh, of an officer who would lead uh, lead enlisted men into Steinbeck's sleeping quarters so that they could look at him sleeping. And when he was told that people were coming in in the night to watch him sleeping, he just well, why why would they want to do that? It was relayed to him that uh, the soldiers were so blown away that anybody uh, would be given three hundred thousand dollars for for their their one of their novels to become uh, a movie. That they just wanted to see this man, even if he was asleep. <laughs> and, uh, Steinbeck commented, "Well, geez, I'd like to see that three hundred thousand dollars too." <laughs> Various agents got uh, got a cup before he got uh, his. So um, the moon is down. <coughs> I think played an important role in uh, solidifying uh, resistance in Nazi-occupied Europe. He would receive a medal from the King of Norway for his service to the country, and uh, you know, the, the, I mean, the novel wasn't universally panned by the critics, but it was you know, pretty thoroughly panned, and uh, you know, yet, yet the people in occupied countries saw the message that he was trying to get across. And it's sort of, you know, at the very end of the novel, these, uh, you get the, um, uh, these packages get dropped uh, from, uh, you know, allied planes. And they're, you know, providing the basis for resistance. These uh, uh, explosive devices that can be set off. And you see that um, this is, you know, it, it, it connected with the audience it was supposed to connect with. Um, I think it connected with an American audience too, to some degree. I mean, it was a pretty successful film. I mean, um, but I don't know. I, I think you know maybe it's hard after you know whether it's a novelist after a novel like *The Grapes of Wrath* or whether it's uh, you know Bruce Springsteen after *Born to Run* and *Darkness on the Edge of Town*. I think it can be hard to get critical acclaim when your work moves in different directions. And Steinbeck had written about migrant labor, now he needed to write about something different. And it, the work was viewed by a lot of literary critics as simply too propagandistic. When Donald Coors from Texas was here for the Steinbeck Festival a year ago, yes. he said, after the war, uh, some Norwegians uh, visited New York to read John Steinbeck, and the leader said, how could you know 3,000 miles away, never having seen us or met us, how could you know what we were doing and how we were thinking? Right. And he said, I tried to imagine what I would do and how I would think. Right. Mm -hmm. We had a wonderful exhibit of uh, 
uh, for moving this down with the foreign language editions of the work in the, uh, in online. the it's, it's, it's online. Yeah, it, it was in the uh, the lab uh, room, which is no sense of direction. So it's somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in this very building, is where it is. So you mentioned that his first draft of the book was rejected because it was like set, yeah. by censors. Yeah, so, by the government. It was so, said in America. So too. Yeah. during World War II, were all very works submitted to censors before publishing? No, no, no. I mean, he was actually writing The Moon is Down and Bombs Away for American government agencies. Oh. Yeah, yeah. All right. So it's not that American literary works were being okay. subjected to censorship. It was that he, he was actually writing these for the government. You, you said he tried to get into the military, but he was rejected. Why was he rejected for the military? Well, <laughs> Kevin, you want, you want to jump in on He was 39 years old. Yeah, I mean, he was, yeah, I mean, he was 39. He was too old. Okay. He did take, he took, a, he took a physical, apparently passed the physical. He, um, he wanted to be in, in uh, the intelligence unit, and I think he was rejected from that because the lingering concerns over his 1930s uh, writings and associations were just too great. I think Steinbeck non-fiction books are as interesting as his novels. Don't you? I think so too. Yeah, I I, uh, I find a Russian journal to be one of the most uh, enlightening uh, of Steinbeck's works, and the uh, the World War II dispatches. I mean, once there was a war, I d I've never really understood why. Uh, why were they not published as a book at the time? So many of Steinbeck's other works had been you know, serialized, but then published right afterwards and did very well. I would have thought that once there was a war as a collection, it might have done quite well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, uh, well, it wouldn't have done very well in Oklahoma. It would have done well in, <laughs> in every other state. Uh, yes? I'm not sure, but I think I read somewhere that Steinbeck wrote the application to Russia based on the fact that some people Russian government had, were so impressed with the grapes of wrath. Yeah. So I'm not you, sure if that's true or not. Yeah, so if you look back back here, it's kind of amazing to, you know, probably all the answers to the questions are somewhere in these <laughs> yeah. specific cases. Yeah. But uh, in the USSR, the USSR, the 1941 edition of the Grapes of Wrath was the largest single printing of any American work. Uh, 300,000 copies in one distribution. Steinbeck didn't get one penny because the Soviet government didn't recognize American copyright. So um, Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath was, was viewed as uh, a work very much in line with, uh, with Soviet thinking. And it's a very interesting sort of dance that Steinbeck uh, and Kappa do with, uh, with the Russian authorities. They know that they're being spoon-fed the things that the Russian government, the Soviet government wants them to see. They know that. But they also know that if they're able to spend time with ordinary people, they'll see more than the Russian government wants, than the Soviet government wants them to see. So it ends up being a much more uh, revealing look at the Soviet Union than the Soviet government had imagined would be possible, given how scripted they tried to make the whole visit. But it's a wonderful book. I mean, uh, I think uh, a Russian journey is, uh, well, if you haven't read that one, I would highly recommend it. The copies in the bookstore. Mm -hmm. That and all of the works, it turns out, here and there. Later in life, did John ever realize uh, his reward from the Prince of Wrath? Did he ever appreciate from, it? From the Soviet Union? No, no, mm -hmm. from the distribution in, in America. Yeah, I mean, he I thought it would be very short term, but yeah, no, I mean the the book ended up doing very well, and Steinbeck did well from from both uh, the sales of the novel and and the sales of uh, and, and the the movie rights. Uh, when he won the Pulitzer Prize, you know, a sign of the character that Steinbeck was, he gave the prize money away to uh, one of his friends, uh, Richie Lovejoy, who was trying to complete a novel. Um, he. Uh, with the Grapes of Wrath, he, he was not comfortable with all of the um, coverage that accompanied uh, his success, and he uh, wouldn't do any promotional 
uh, events for the Grapes of Wrath, with the exception of uh, they had uh, it was a, a leather-bound, uh, very small uh, edition, small run of the book that uh, was produced, and they were sold at auction to raise money for migrant families, and that was uh, one of the only promotional events that, that he did. Um, he, I mean, he sort of got you know, caught up in a, a swirl of fame that he didn't expect, but it wasn't just fame for a literary author. I mean, it was uh, you know, caught in the crosshairs of, of people who, you know, despised the work, and there were public, you know, burnings and bans of the work, and uh, I, I think that was very, very difficult f for him. And then, you know, the, the things going on in his personal life as well. But, yeah, I mean, I th in many ways, I think the Nobel Prize was, well, it was probably based more on the Grapes of Wrath than any other work. I mean, we, we've sort of rediscovered since Oprah Winfrey's book <coughs> that uh, uh, East of Eden, you know, may in fact be the, uh, you know, the more enduring novel, but they're both you know, wonderful works. But, yeah, I think Steinbeck got his due from The Grapes of Wrath, but I think you're right, he probably hasn't got his due from a lot of the non-fiction uh, work that he produced. He yeah. would not write any uh, more novels after uh, Winter of Our Discontent in uh, the early 60s. You know, he, was, he felt <coughs> so wounded by the bad press he received when, when he won the Nobel Prize and literary critics saying that he didn't deserve it, that he didn't write a, a work of fiction again. And that was my question. Which of his works do you consider the greatest? Yeah. I was having a, a chat with, with uh, one of our audience members uh, uh, a little while ago about this, and I, I guess I go back and forth between Grapes of Wrath and East of Eden. Uh, they're the two biggest works. I think they're the most complex in their structures, and uh, yeah, another parallel between the two, uh, it's not an absolute parallel because Steinbeck writes journals while he's writing three novels. So uh, Grapes of Wrath, East of Eden, but also The Wayward Bus, uh, which, which I, I think is a pretty good novel, but it's not a great uh, novel. Uh, but I think the journal, Working Days, and then the, uh, the East of Eden letters, um, they're, they're such wonderful, revealing works. I think we have such great insights into his creative process. Um, there's also a set of letters here uh, in the archive uh, of their letters from Pascal Cavici, Steinbeck's editor, to Steinbeck uh, in the late 40s. This is in the wake of Ed Rickett's death, uh, which was uh, you know, a huge, huge blow to, to Steinbeck. And, Steinbeck was trying to sort of find his feet again, and in those letters from Cavici, I think you, ha you have somebody who understands Steinbeck better than Steinbeck really under understands himself at that moment, and Cavici's encouraging him to, to write this novel, which he says will have the, an impact on the scale of the Grapes of Wrath, but you have to you know, write a novel that big, that complex, to, to pull that off. Uh, so I, I go back and forth between those two, but I'll be honest, I don't think either of them is his best written work. I think Cannery Row uh, is the best writer. Uh, you know, maybe Sweet Thursday's not, not that far behind. I think it's a thoroughly underrated uh, work. But um, yeah, it's a sort of sustained work of, of fiction, the, the complexity of both The Grapes of Wrath and East of Eden. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> All right. Yeah, yeah. I should have a good answer to this question because I, I heard somebody, uh, one of the sort of preeminent Woody Guthrie specialists, giving a, uh, a lecture on uh, Woody Guthrie's life. And um, I mean, very much aware of each other, right? I mean, Dust Bowl Ballads uh, comes out uh, right around the time. The grapes of right? So, you, you know, and Dust Bowl Ballads with, with you know, Tom Joe Part One and Two, right? Um, it, it it sort of provides validation, you know, for, for the novel. Uh, so, you know, I think there's an awareness, but I, I don't think there's, you know, he didn't try and collaborate with Woody Guthrie the way, well, Woody Guthrie didn't try and collaborate with Steinbeck the way that Dorothea Lang. For example, uh, 
and I think he probably uh, was more familiar with, you know, more influenced by Kerry McWilliams. Yeah. Very much a part of that atmosphere at the end of the 30s, beginning of the 40s. Yeah. I, I'm just realizing that it, I, I'm standing between you and, and some nice California wines, so that's, that's, that's my biggest worry. Right? I just recently saw Mother Road up at Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Yes. And I wondered what you thought that um, Steinbeck might think of Mother Road. Have you seen it? I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. No, I don't have to see it. Yeah, it's, it's worth, for me, it's worth yeah. the it's worth yeah. it. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try and come back with an answer to that okay. in the <laughs> not, not too distant future. Uh, yes. And did you become interested in Steinbeck because of those books in that book? I think I first became interested in Steinbeck because of those books, and I read uh, I read of Mice and Men, and um, the way the bus was there. I mean, I, I just it makes no sense. I mean, why that one would be there? Uh, I didn't read uh, the Great Japan at the time, but I read several of the shorter works, and um, yeah, I think I was influenced. But the real influence came. I mean, the. the that was influence enough that when I went to Ohio University in the mid-1980s for graduate school, I did my MA and then I was starting my PhD and so now we're at about 1987, uh, 87, yeah, 87, 88, and I've got to find what they call a cognate field, right? Um, so you, you do your fields in history, so I did American intellectual history, history of ideas in America. My friends in England joked when I said I was leaving to go to America to do a graduate degree in American intellectual history. One of them said, oh, no, you, you'll be back soon then. <laughs> you know, another one said, oh, is that a weekend course? <laughs> but I, I did the MA in American intellectual history and just fell in love with the history of ideas in America and decided to stay. And I did fields in American history, Russia, Soviet Union. Uh, colonial and modern Latin America, so the Mexico uh, exhibit here, and uh, then you had to do a cognate field, a field in another discipline outside of your discipline, and Ohio University had a Steinbeck scholar named Bob DeMont, and he was teaching a course, it was a graduate seminar on John Steinbeck, I read some Steinbeck uh, you know, back in England, and so I signed up for that course, and it was absolutely transformative, I remember more about that course than I remember about Maybe all of my history courses uh, put together, which, which really is just a sad reflection on a life spent as a historian that probably should have been spent uh, in the field of literature. Anyway, I, I got there in the end, or sort of partially there. So, yeah, thanks so much for coming out tonight.